We're going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 1, from verse 5 to the last verse of that chapter. The, the passage is going to be on your screen, so read after me, or oh, read with me. The Bible says, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant and I now, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the, statu the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servants today and grant him mercy in the sight of his man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Continue to speak to us, O oh God. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We can take our seats. Good morning, Flight Church. You guys made it to church on a rainy Sunday morning. May God be praised. I see some of us are wearing our jumpers. Some of us are wearing our shorts. You know, we receive the code differently. But may God be what? Amen. Amen. That side was more, they're more ready this side. May God be? Amen. What's going on here, guys? May God be? Amen. Amen. Now today we are in week two of our series, Dependent on God. And this is our prayer series, this is our fasting series, this is a series where we are looking at how as believers we need to function because of God. We can't function outside of God. And for so long I believe that you and I have believed the lie that has been sold to us that says we that, that says God only helps those who help themselves. Have we heard that before? That God only helps those who help themselves. And I'm calling it a lie because it is a lie. But I think we believe that lie because you and I, we love a good story. You know, we love the story of rags to riches. You know, we love that story of coming from nowhere to being somewhere. We love that story of Miss Independent, as Neil sang it. You know, people who have their own thing, people who are starting from nowhere and you can trace where they're going. We love that story, but we dismiss the fact that our entire existence is actually in God's hands. For us to breathe, for us to live, for us to do anything, if you can trace the timeline of your life, you can see that it has been God throughout. Because our entire existence is in the hands of God. And now whenever we focus on ourself, whenever we focus on our independence, whenever we focus on that story we like to give from rags to riches, we are leading with pride. And most times when we're leading with pride, we want people to see us to say, hey, I've made it. We are leading with ego. And most times we lead with ego, we want to tell people to say, hey, I'm the man. You know, I'm the man. Look at me. I've done this. I've achieved these things. We are leading with a selfish ambition. And whenever we're leading with selfish ambition, we're telling people that, hey, I fought my way up here. And so I can't help you. You need to fight the same way you fight. We've probably heard our parents say this. I used to walk. You know? So what is this you're facing? We have suffered. And most times it's to show us or to tell us that they have made it on their own. They have done it. And we usually love those type of stories. Because when someone has done made it, then you can trace back to see that you, have, you can also do the same. But we forget the fact that our entire existence is in God's hands. 
And if our dependence is on God, then we need to lead with humility. If our dependence is on God, then we need to be led by confession and repentance. If our dependence is on God, then we need to be people who are being held accountable. People who are accountable for our actions. And if our dependence is on God, then we need to rely on his word. None of this being self-made. None of this being, hey, we have gotten here. Because if you can trace the timeline of your life, you agree that God's hand has been on you. But more than that, God is holding you in his hands. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And so we can only depend on him. And we see that in Nehemiah's prayer, the, the, the prayer we just read, where he continues to realize that he is nothing without God. He is nothing without God. And so if you're taking notes, how do we see Nehemiah's dependence through this prayer? The first thing is we see his dependence on God was led through humility. It led him to humility. It led him to be a person who is filled with humility. We see that in verse 5. The Bible says, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. That is humility right there. He doesn't pray that prayer like that. He doesn't start that prayer like that if he is not led with humility. And if you look at the word humility in the dictionary sense, it's the opposite of pride, right? Because once you look at humility, you realize how great God is and how we are not. When you look at humility, you realize how mighty God is and how we are not. And oftentimes, you and I are going to pray, especially when it's seasons like this of fasting and prayer, we pray from a posture of pride. What do I mean? I mean we pray from, from looking at things, from saying, what if I pray in such a right manner, in such a right way, if I use this word, if I kneel down, if I wear these clothes, if I do such a thing and pray to God, then he's going to answer my prayer for what it is that I want. And if you look at pride, especially as a believer, when we are prideful, then we are assuming God's place in our lives. But we need to be people who are led or who lead with humility. And I think for us, especially in this season of prayer and fasting, what if God is calling us not to answer those prayers we want him to answer, not to get what it is that we want to get from him, but what if he is calling us to just see how great he is? What if he's just calling us to just realize how, how mighty he is? Because I believe that it would be better if he did not answer our prayers, but if we go to a point of realizing that he is a great God. Because if we realize that he is a great God, then we can come to a place of recognizing that only he knows best. And I don't know about you, but it's better to live in a posture of God knowing what's best for me than me thinking what's best for me. It's better living in a life where you know that God is, is, is authoring your life. God is directing your life. So you are following what he knows what's best for you as opposed to you just going about what you think is best for you. I've seen this in my life. My, my life is a great example of this. I studied mass communication in college. Which means, my dream, my goals for my life was I should be working for the best media company in the land right now. My goal, my dream for my life is I should be a public relations, not officer, manager. You know, somewhere there in, uh, in one of the NGOs that pay people in US dollars or one of these corporate organizations. But God's goal for my life was that he ordains me as a pastor. That I plant a church in Mzuzu and that I use that skill for mass communication every Sunday to preach. If you were with me in college, you would realize I was actually, if you ask my classmates, I was not good at sermon prep. I used to hate it. But here we are, week in, week out. That's something I have to do. Because God's plan for our lives is better than whatever you and I can plan for our lives. And it's humbling. Because, because it, take, it takes us off course. But like what, I, what I like to say is it's better to be or to, it's better to walk on God's detour 
or in God's, you know, shortcut. You know, when you're in the hood, there's these passages that look very weird. Like, but it gets you to where you want to go. And then there's the right passage. Because it's better to, to walk on God's detour than walking in our own highway. Because God knows best. And I think for some of us, what we think is best is going to that college outside the country to pursue a master's degree. For some of us, what we think is best is getting that high-paying job. We see our friends always posting on LinkedIn saying they are now working in a new position. LinkedIn is a really messed up website for your mental health. If you're on it, you know what I'm talking about. Because you see your friends are advancing and you are planting a church in Zuzu. You see your, your, your fellow people are getting those degrees and you are still like, no, I need to plant this church. I can't make any other move up until I move. For some of us, what's good to us is to actually get married because we are looking at the watch and you're saying, the time is ticking. Or looking at the watch, you're saying, mm, all my friends are getting married. All the people around me are getting married. But what God knows is best for you is where you are right now. Because God does not make mistakes. And where he has you right now is where he wants you to obey him fully. Because it leads us to humility. It's a place where we realize that God is mighty. It's a place where we realize that God is great. And so if God is mighty, if God is great, it means he knows best. And so we can trust him. Nehemiah's humility in the prayer we, we read, it led him to praise God in the midst of what wasn't an ideal situation. He says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Humility, when it comes to prayer, it allows us to remember who God is. But also it, it allows us to remember who we are. It allows us to remember who we are. That we are man. Because we're man, we're fallen. Because we're fallen, we're mortal. Because we're mortal, we don't keep our word. Because we don't keep our word, we are as messed up as they come. And because we're as messed up as they come, we are sinful. And so we can't trust in our own ways, guys. I can't trust myself. Because even I'll be selfish to myself. But humility also reminds us who God is is, and that he is a faithful God. As Nehemiah prayed, he says he is steadfast in his love. As Nehemiah prayed and reminded him of his word, he is a God who keeps his word. As Nehemiah prayed, we see that he is a God who is mighty to save, and that is why we can depend on him. Now, secondly, dependence on God, it led Nehemiah to confession and repentance, both. Not just one, but both. It led Nehemiah to confession and repentance. In verse 6 and 7 it says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that I now pray before you day and night. For the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant, Moses. Now, one of my closest friends, his name is Harry. He's, uh, he's in Lilongwe. He also works for Flood in Lilongwe. It's actually his birthday today. So, Harry, if you're watching, happy birthday. He's a very old man right now. But Harry is one of my closest friends. And I say that because Harry is my accountability partner. You know, I always say this. If you ever want to bring me down, go connive with Harry. Because he knows things that I probably don't even know about myself. Because you know, he's my accountability partner. We confess sins to one another. I tell him stuff that I wouldn't tell anyone else. He tells me stuff that I wouldn't tell anyone else as well. That is how accountability works. However, we noticed a trend amongst our friendship. When we were confessing to one another, especially about the same thing, over and over again. And we had to stop and say, bro... We keep coming back to confess this same sin. What's going on? It's when we realized we had become very good at confession, but very bad at repentance. We had become so good at confessing each other's sins so that we can feel safe 
so that we can know, mm, I've, at least I've trolled someone. And so if the whole world finds out, at least he knows. But I'd go back to sin the same way. And for most of us in our Christian walk, that is how we're living life. Where we've become so good at confessing our sin to a point where we abuse God's grace and we are not repentant. We are not repentant. However, Nehemiah, he does both. Where he confesses the sins of his people, he's actually also confessing the sins of himself. And then his repentance is shown how he realizes how corrupt his heart is. His, his repentance is shown here how he realizes how their hearts have been against God and how they did not keep his commandments. Because you and I, we can come to a place where we can confess our sins. We can confess how we are sleeping around. We can confess how we are drinking and getting drunk. We can confess how we are struggling with all these things, how we are struggling with porn, how we are cheating on our partners, how we are lying, how we are stealing. We can confess all that and we need to confess. We need to come to a place where you confess because the Bible in Romans 10 allows us to know that it is that confession that allows us to believe in God. But we also need to repent. We also need to repent because repentance is not just the conviction of that sin, but it is turning away from that sin and looking towards Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one who can make us better. Repentance is turning away from that sin and looking towards Jesus because Jesus is the only one who can break that chain. So we need to confess and repent. We see Nehemiah do that. But one more aspect I wanted, I wanted to bring to us is that of accountability. We need to take accountability for our actions. And I think this is something that believers struggle with. Christians I have noticed we struggle a lot with taking accountability. We would rather place blame on someone else and move on. It's why you're going to notice and see that there's people who are actually okay with moving from relationship to relationship, relationship to relationship, because they don't want to take accountability of what happened. And so the easiest thing for us to do is run, is to move on. So you're going to find people who are moving churches. We're just changing churches. We're in this church this week, and next year we're in this church, the other year we're in this church because we do not want to take accountability of the part we played, of the damage that we played. Yes, maybe things happened to you in that place. Maybe things did happen in that relationship. They say it takes two to tango. But you are the other one. So you need to take accountability for your actions. We need to be accountable for the things we do. And Nehemiah, he did not just see the sin of other people. He did not just see the mistakes that his family made. He actually also said, I have sinned. He took accountability for his own action. He was accountable for the wrongdoings of not just his family, but himself as well. And I get it. Most times, accountability is not comfortable. Because you're sitting there. And you're admitting to the things you've done. So it's not comfortable. And sometimes accountability is uh, weaponized. It's used as a weapon. And you're scared. Right? Sometimes that's how we feel. However, be it discomfort or be it, it being weaponized, on the other side of accountability is someone who is self-aware. And I'm saying this because if you are accountable for the things you do, then you know that if you are acting the same way you acted four relationships ago, then something needs to change. Because if, no, if you are not held accountable, you are bleeding on people you're not supposed to be bleeding on. It allows you to, to, to be self-aware because you know that if you are acting the same way in this church as the way you were acting in three churches ago, then maybe the problem is not the church. Maybe the problem is not the leaders of that space. Maybe the problem is how you view leadership. Maybe the problem is how you're not repentant. Maybe the problem is how you feel always as if you need to be respected in that place and not being held accountable to how you acted in that place. Now you're bleeding on people you're not supposed to bleed on. People who are there to help you. And if you're here, I'm not saying leave. Actually, you're welcome. You can stay. But what I'm saying is, if you're not held accountable for the actions, 
then this will just be one of those places you're walking by. And the next place you're going to be at, same old story. Just a different day. So accountability, it allows us to be self-aware. But it also allows us to be dependent on God. Because then we know we cannot function without God. Then we know that only God can help us to change. Only God can help us to be the person he wants us to be. Because accountability, what it does is it bruises our ego. I don't know if your ego has been bruised before, but that hurts. But it bruises our ego. It allows us to notice our sin, to say, I am human too, and I, I can also make mistakes. It allows us to, to allow you to, to notice that you are fallen. And so as a fallen creature, as a fallen person, I am able to also make mistakes. But it also allows us to come back to God. Because he is the only one who can change our hearts. He is the only one who can fix us. And so we need to depend on him. And lastly, dependence on God led Nehemiah back to God's word. Verse 8 and 9 says, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. The verse 8 starts with the word remember. Remember. It's taking us back to God's word because God's word is true for who he is and God's word is a lifeline for our souls. It is very unfortunate if we claim to know God, it's very unfortunate if we claim to be Christians and to be about God if we do not know his word. And it breaks my heart. Because I think we're living in an age and a generation where we are more concerned about receiving signs and wonders than we are concerned about what God's word might be saying. I was actually with uh, my wife and Robert last week, uh, her brother, and we were watching Rema Church from South Africa. There's a pastor there called Pastor Cabello Mabalani. Uh, who knows the Kwaito group TKZ it's from back in the day? So, yeah, we're all young, I can tell. But the ones who are saying yes, I can also tell, you know. From that group is a guy called Cabello, and he got saved and is now a pastor at the church in South Africa called Rema. And as he was preaching, he said this thing that has stuck with me. He says, stop looking for a sign, look for a verse. As you start the year, stop looking for a sign, look for a verse. And I love that because I feel like there's a growing thirst to just look for signs and wonders. There's a growing thirst to see where the signs and wonders are happening around us so that we can go there as opposed to being in God's word. It's why we end up being in a place where we are just depending on men of God than depending on God. We're depending on people like you and I. People who breathe. People, people who can get sick. People who can also fail. Because we are so thirsty to be shown signs and wonders, then we are thirsty about God's work. We look for signs, and we hardly ask God to remember what is in his word. Because what is in God's word is what's true about God. And what is in God's word is true about us if we are children of God. His promises are true about us, and we can trust that he is faithful especially if we are his children. Now, dependence on God, it brings us to God's word because God's word is living. Dependence on God brings us to God's word because his word is true. Because his word is like a lamp and to our feet. His word is living. It is active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Nehemiah, as he prayed, he took it back to God's word. Where he reminds God to say, this is what you said to your servant Moses in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 30. Because God's word is true about God. It is true about his nature. It is true about who he is. And his promises are true when it comes to his children. His promises are true when it comes to his people. Now as we fast and pray, I'm, fin I'm finishing now. But as we fast and pray, 
especially in this season. And as we face life in the uncertainties that the world brings with it, I want us to ask this one question. Always ask this question. What is his word saying? Ask that. There's a lot of things happening. There's rumors of wars and wars happening. There's discouragement we're facing. There's heartbreaks we're facing. There's fear we're facing. And so as we are facing life on a day-to-day, instead of running around and looking for signs and wonders to see when our problems will end, I have bad news for you. That problem might end, but there's a next one waiting for you. And signs and wonders will only get you to that first problem that's finished. But God's word will get you through life. And so we need to ask, what is God's word saying about my situation? What is it saying about my current situation? His word might be saying, be still and know that I am God. What is God's word saying about my fear? I'm scared. We're writing exams next week. I'm scared. I'm scared. I just got married. I'm scared. I don't know how life is going to look. I'm scared. I just lost my job. I'm scared. I don't know how things are going to go with my life in this economic climate. Instead of going to look for signs and wonders, what is God's word saying? God's word is saying, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What is God's word saying about my friendships? What is God's word saying about my relationships? What is God's word saying about the people I bring into my life or the people who are not in my life? God's word might be saying to you this morning, do not be unequally yoked with unbelief. Now, you and I, we're human. And as humans, we have the tendency to side with our flesh. Because that's our nature. And siding with our flesh will bring, will bring us to places and moments where we are selfish. It will bring us to places and moments where we're prideful. Where our ego is on top of the world. But if we depend on God, We need to realize that He makes us humble. So we lead with humility. That He forgives our sins with His love and His sacrifice. So we lead with confession and repentance. We need to realize that His word is living. That His word is true. His word is active. His word is what pierced through our hearts to accept him, to believe in him. And so with everything going on, all other ground will be sinking sand if we do not depend and rely on his word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us see you for who you are. Help us depend on you. In Jesus' name.